View from the Gutters, Episode 7. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Persepolis, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 10658. Is, every, is everybody ready then? Every, is everybody ready? Yes. Yep. This okay. is, oh my god, It's this is episode 70. It is, and I'm Tobias Panchin. Welcome to View from the Gutters, <laughs> putting the cart before the horseman. I'm Joe Preddy. I think. Brant Eddy. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. And once again, Shard is not with us. He, uh, we were expecting him back from Cookie Kevin, and he is still in the corner. I'm actually suspecting that that's not really Chard, and that he got a life or I, something. I feel like maybe we just overly estimated his ability to rise from the dead. That's true. I mean, I'm not sure. But Cade is also missing. We're not sure where... We're not sure where the ginger yeti is. Have, have you looked under Chard? I, I didn't want to go there. I'm not going over there. Okay. So, There's a lot uh, of different things that that evokes. I'm just <laughs> not going to touch. One quick announcement before we get started. There is one more week left in our win a copy of the Absolute Batman the Long Halloween contest. Uh, if you haven't been following us and you don't know about the contest, uh, we're doing a drive. So... If you follow us on Twitter, if you subscribe to us on YouTube, if you leave us an iTunes review, or if you like us on Facebook, each of those things will win, enter, or earn you one entry into the contest on January 9th. June 9th? Or, June 9th. On June 9th, <laughs> we're going to do a drawing, and one person will win a free copy of Batman The Long Halloween, The Absolute Edition. So if you're interested in entering that contest, you uh, can get up to four entries to win and get that done by Sunday, June 8th. Yep. Do it. Uh, last time I checked, we were only one like away on our Facebook page from 200 likes. That was the situation the last time I checked. So you could be the 200th like. Wow. How wow. special would you feel? Accolades aplenty. I'm just saying. From, from who? It's a lofty, <laughs> it's a lofty thing. From me. Think about what you can tell your friends. I was the 200th like. <laughs> I don't think anyone would want to tell their friends that. I was the two hundred two hundredth loser to like this page. I don't know. Did I you, hope I win ooh. like a comic or something. This is Jesus. why we don't want Kay- to have Kaylee on the show very often because she refers to you, our beautiful, wonderful listeners, as losers. I'm. So, it's just. I, <laughs> I just not a fan of most people, so I just assume that they're all disappointments. Wow, <clears throat> that's. Uh, I think we. I want to argue with you, but I can't. I've worked in customer service for too long. It's just... Well, and Kaylee worked today, too, and she works at a restaurant as a waitress. Uh, yeah. That's just not a recipe for having a good opinion of humanity. No, it's no. really not. So, uh, so but rest let's, assured that let's the rest talk of us about something <laughs> incredibly upbeat and optimistic. Persepolis. Persepolis. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, and, Joe, you pitched Persepolis for I did. You. Do uh, you want to... Start us off. Well, I'm gonna. I'm going to first counter by saying I do find this. Uh, I mean, it's it's difficult to read at times, but I do find it optimistic. And I actually am really interested to hear what Kaylee has to say, since um, I'm sure people get tired of listening to me talk every once in a while. But also because I was really interested in her. This is the first time she's read it, so. Mm-hmm. What, right. did, what did you think, Kaylee? Uh, I really liked it. I studied a lot of like Eastern religion and stuff in college. Um, and so it was interesting to me to see like where you're not viewing it at like viewing religion or like a culture as an outsider. You're viewing it as somebody who's like a part of it, but who also wants to change it uh, because she's a, a revolutionary and um, her parents are revolutionaries. It's just like this long history of like wanting change. Um, I thought it was really cool to kind of see this where it wasn't like, look, it's this cool exotic thing. It was, this is the norm. This is my life here. And these are the things that's wrong with it. But also like 
my life is kind of awesome at the same time with certain things. Like I've got a great loving family and like I did go to a really good school and things like that. You know, it was just, it was really cool. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was really cool to kind of see it from an insider perspective. Yeah. It's definitely very interesting to get a look at a society that we hear a lot of propaganda about from the powers that be within our own society and actually get to see it from the perspective of somebody who's a part of that society and who's growing up in it. And for them, like it is the normal, even as it's changing in all of these really wet, like kind of terrible ways, there's always that sense of normalcy that asserts itself as they adjust to the changing situation and the landscape within their country where it's like, oh yeah, now we got to wear the veils. And like, that's just, that's a part of life. That's part of the game that you have to play just in order to succeed. And at first I thought, oh wow, this story is really interesting. Like how horrible must it be to live in a society where you have to like do all these things and play all of these roles and there's all these games that you have to go through in order to, just to get by in your normal day. And then I thought to myself, is our society really that different? I mean, no, no one's going to cart you off to prison in the middle of the night and whip you and leave you in an unmarked grave with all the other political dissidents. But there are still a lot of games that we have to play in our society in terms of acting as society insists that we should in order to get along. And if you don't play that game, like there can be significant consequences for you, uh, especially as somebody who's not white, not male, not Christian. Yeah, I, um, the the interesting thing uh, for me about this book, I I love the in the intro, uh, Marjane Satrapi talks about how um, there's a lot. Uh, one of the reasons she wanted to do Persepolis was to show people her homeland, the place where she was from and 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 a much more realistic way than a lot of uh people a lot of western people understand it you know it's it's we have a very um one dimensional idea of what muslims do and what it what islam is in this country and um i think she really it's I, I think that in and of itself is a huge obstacle to tackle in a book. And I think to tell the story of your upbringing and to tell it as well, this is the second time I've read it. And I, I'm really kind of floored by the way she manages to tell her story. And it, I mean, it really avoids a lot of the traps of the biographer, which is, kind of falling into sentimentality, this whole best of times, worst of times mentality that can really taint a narrative. Um, well, it feels very conversational. It does. It does. She's very, you know, as a lot of people that have lived through terror and a lot of people that have lived through upheaval, she's very matter of fact about a lot of it. Um, and I'm really, I'm, I'm struck by that. Uh, I love, I think this book does an incredible job of, conveying I, I mean she she's very good at using not just her words but like the art of the book lends itself very well to kind of the symbolism that she's trying to do and I don't think um, when I originally read this I read this for a graphic novel class in college and we talked about would this book have worked as well as prose as straight prose and I don't I think you would have lost a lot of it I think that uh, and one of the things I want to get into a little bit later is just how cool I think biographical comics are. But um, I think this book is as hard hitting as it is because it is a graphic narrative. Uh, and because without without the the art, it it would border on dry. It would border on just kind of like she's just kind of being because she is so matter of fact. But with the art, it adds a richness. Well, I, I think that that's an interesting point because with, with with any situation where somebody is relating to you a story which is ostensibly true, you have to consider the extent to which their experience of the event 
colors what they're relating to you. And I think that her artwork is another color in this story. The way that you experience the events that she's relating to you are shaped by the way in which she's drawing them. And to a certain extent, the cartoonish nature of it makes it feel a little bit more like you don't get bogged down in kind of the horror of the war. Like it feels lighter because it's cartoony. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think kind of the same way that Mouse does. Oh, absolutely. And Mouse is obviously <clears throat> dealing with something kind of even more horrendous than what Marjane went through. You know, with the Holocaust and all of that. And you kind of get that even starker contrast between, oh, look, there's cartoon mice and, oh, my God, the horrible things they're doing to it. Like, I don't think that there's that extreme of a color on this, but it is something that I considered when I was reading it. Like, how much of what we're being told is her relating her experience versus this is what actually went on. Well, and I especially think, a lot of the things when she was a younger child. Yeah, I think that uh, like I think that like Mouse, this um, one of the things that uh, is interesting to me about this book is that it is a multi-layered narrative. On on one layer you have her story, and on the the other you have the story of of the country she is from and the changes it went through and how, and you're seeing them through her eyes. So of course, you know, I mean, that's, I think what gives it the, I mean, this is not journalistic in any sense. This is personal. This is a very memoir. personal, huh? Memoir. Yeah, it's a memoir. So, and in that way, I mean, some of the hardest parts of mouse to read for me are, are reading about Art Spiegelman's relationship with his father and how strained it is at times. And some of, the hardest parts of this to read for me are her, especially when she is a child, trying to kind of like, like, like parse this information that she's getting. You know, she sees her parents wanting to be revolutionaries, and at the same point, at the same time, people are dying, and she doesn't really, she knows what that is, but it's not something that she identifies with on an emotional level. You know, she sees the revolution as this kind of great and glorious thing because she's basically parroting her parents at that point. I just think that um, some of the uh, it's I I think it it takes a talented author to pull that off, to tell a uh, multi-layered narrative in the way that they're that Marjane is doing in this and in the way Spiegelman does in in Mouse. That's that's fair. Brent, you've been quiet thus far and it seems and, like you and, were looking for a moment to get a point in you look quite wistful over there as well i do look wistful this book has a lot of different uh things to talk about as far as how it uses its various tools um speaking about what's what you just said joe that the the interesting thing from my perspective is while i think she does a very good job of conveying her earnest perception of things at those times especially more and more as she gets to adulthood she makes it very clear that she is filling in events with things that people tell her after the fact so it's clear that this wasn't just an active memoir and like i'm going to write down what i remember she clearly talked to her family and her friends about things that occurred and she even uses the the omniscient camera so to speak of the of the um art to help convey uh things that she wouldn't have awareness of at the time uh, really one of the strongest examples that just has burned into my mind ever since i first read this is there's a she's relating the story of how she met her first husband and she does two things in that little vignette one is is that during the the panels of how of basically showing time passing in her and her soon-to-be husband are kind of lost in conversation she actually draws the hostess looking at the camera getting mad that she can't seem to get them to come to dinner like she intrudes in one panel and says come to it's time for dinner she comes back two panels later and like you can see that she's mad and she's looking at the reader and then the other thing she that marjan does at the end of the that little vignette is say i found out later that the hostess wanted to hook 
this guy up with her best friend. This is why we're not friends anymore. And she basically never talked to me anymore. So she does insert other pieces of information that are not purely her experience, both right. visually and through prose. And I think that that also shows a level of uh, investment in the attempt to, sh- to kind of create a more complex narrative than just, this is what I remember. Yeah. Um, which I think gives it a humanity, uh, an, an additional layer of humanity. Absolutely. It's immersive is yeah. what, is what I feel this book is. And, uh, it's immersive in a way that I think is difficult to do in prose because you cannot language. I, I've always felt that manipulating language itself is a far, far different thing. And you have to, I almost, I almost wonder if, uh, the reason I'm able to connect with this more is because the art is so personal. Right. Cause it's, it's her own art. There's also that issue of when you're writing a, something that's purely written, the reader is basically has the opportunity to infer and, and insert their own mind's eye image of whatever they're reading. They Absolutely. process what you write and they insert their own, um, their own image of it. Look no further than discussions on the internet about who gets to cast to play different characters from popular books. Right. And well, that's not how I saw them in my mind by presenting this visually more. She actually is able to accomplish two separate things, right? She's able to present it in a style which sometimes softens. It can soften the more difficult emotional elements like ultimately like later on in the novel where one of her friends falls off the roof after being chased by the, the the um well, it wasn't technically the cops it's the other group um, it's the um, um the brotherhood of the revolution or right. something, yeah. to, something um like you know there's a it's simple enough that you certainly understand the stakes but it's also kind of light enough in style that you're not feeling you like you know if you had watched that as a film and it had been told in a purely a autobiographical or straight memoir style it would be probably devastating to see a guy (laughs) fall off a roof and die being chased by a bunch of other people so she's kind of able to kind of provide both she's forcing you to see what she wants you to see by presenting a visual narrative but is also able to kind of yeah elevate it to almost a conversational these are things that happened please consider them but don't like get caught up in the gore get caught up in the notion of this guy having to run away because we were at a party like ridiculous Mm. is that um, I think that's that, that's actually a really interesting point, and the uh, the moment that I think of in that sense is when her Jewish friend and her family are killed by a missile, and her mother's trying to steer her away from the scene of gore, and yeah. she describes seeing her friend's bracelet on something undescribable, and she doesn't show it to you; she just tells you about it. Right. And I I've, I've been considering the extent to which the art is simplified like whether that was her style like what was she specifically trying to accomplish with that and i think you make an excellent point that the fact that the the style is simplified things don't necessarily have the visual impact that they might otherwise because she's she's not trying to say like look at how horrible this war is look at how gruesome this was She's trying to tell you about the changes that happen in a society and get you to really think about that element. Right. I think at the same time, like the the simple art, it kind of it causes this weird disconnect that you it's not unsimilar to what you what you feel when you hear on the news that somebody was beaten, but they don't show photos of it. Like you imagine it, but you don't really know. Um for me, one image that sticks out is when um, a man is like she's describing a man being chopped up into pieces and they show him being chopped up into pieces. But it's a very cartoony looking character and there's no blood. It's just like a, you know, it's just like this guy and there's like spaces in between his um, between his arms, his legs and his body and his head. And you see that, and it's not gory or anything, but at the same time, it also kind of forces you to think, at least for a second, about what that had to look like in real life. Yeah. And so I think it does a little bit of both, where it softens it, but also makes it harsher, right. uh, depending on how she portrays like certain scenes. Well, I, I think that there's an, an instinct where something is so horrible 
that you just want to look away from it. And the fact that she's softening some of these things allows you to examine it more closely than you would if it were more realistically gruesome like it obviously had to have been. Mm -hmm. There's also that issue where, and I know this has been brought up on the podcast before, the work of Scott McCloud, where he talks extensively in his very first book, Understanding Comics, that by simplifying certain things into more iconographic or more, more iconic, less detailed, it actually tends to evoke more of a sense of I versus they when you're trend, when you're translating art into your brain. Now, I know that there's some critiques of that particular strain of thought. You know, McLeod is not unassailed in that particular um, notion, but I think that that can be at play here. And I have to, I have to believe based on the, the vignette she describes within the book itself and what we know from the book and elsewhere, if you look around, what her level of education is specifically in graphic arts, that if she wanted to make something much more graphic and detailed, she probably could. Especially since this is not a text that was, you know, being dictated as, uh, as far as timelines, the need to publish under a monthly model. She could have taken as much time as she wanted if she wanted to present that in a different, more elaborate style. So she ch clearly thought that this style would have a particular emotive quality to it yeah mm -hmm. well i think I, I think the i think that's a good point that um you don't you want the art to speak for itself but you want especially in something like this when you're relating events that happened um uh, you you don't want you want the art and the narrative to flow together. You don't want one to be too... You don't want people caught up on the gore, like, is that a hand? Is that a charred body? Um, and and for me, it makes it both more terrible in some ways, but also uh, much, much easier to deal with. Uh, the scene where she's talking about the theater burning down, and you have these kind of, like, like fiery kind of... Uh, people um like forms and then they're kind of like transitioning into these like flames that are going out of the building it's I, I mean to me that that speaks much more powerfully to me not just of what happened but of her age when it happened and how it's this is how she thought about it this is what her brain kind of conceived of and um I think that's powerful stuff. And I think that that goes towards the idea of sentimentality. You know, I think that this is this is her sharing. This is not her unburdening herself. Well, I, I, I think that it also approaches the question of accessibility and the fact that presented in the way that it is, it's something that could be read by a 10 or 12 year old. And I don't think that any parent would really look at this and go, oh, my God, this is inappropriate. Like, look at all the dead people. Look at all the, the blood yeah, and the gore. Like, absolutely. It, it presents it on a level where I think the most number of people, especially people who can and should be exposed to the messages of the story, can, you know, can really approach it and gain from it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, it's, it's powerful stuff. I mean, I, I really enjoy reading this. I I really... I, she is definitely somebody I'd very much like to meet one day. Because she just seems like such an amazing person. Uh, and there's this great picture of her on the inside flap of this book where she's just kind of giving you like a little half smile. And you can totally... Her face is just the face of somebody that's like... Yeah, I'm, I'm here and I'm not really going to move aside for you. And I love that. Uh, I love that we see that. It's She has this interesting, uh, one of the things that struck me about this is this kind of precarious balance of her youth where her parents had privilege because, you know, like when she talks about her dad's Cadillac and her maid, and yet... She also, because she was female, she had to wear the veil and uh, she had to kind of live under this religious law that was very much, you know, that, that targeted her for her being female. Hmm. And um, 
uh, I'm always I'm always kind of struck by that. Well, I it it brings up a point that I kind of hit on a little bit at the beginning, but that I actually wanted to talk to Kaylee about specifically since she volunteered to be on this episode, which is you know with all of the things that she goes through as a woman trying to exist in this increasingly fundamentalist society uh and just the way that that reflects upon american society and really makes you think about like how do we treat women you know what are the things that women go through in our society that are largely invisible to us because they're just the background radiation of our existence like the fact that women are kind of expected to wear makeup Mm -hmm. And if you go around without makeup on, like, you're going to get weird looks. And I was wondering if you really had any kind of significant thoughts on that subject, if it resonated with you in a particular way. Uh, Yeah, there is one scene specifically where she's running to catch a bus and the, like, religious guard or whatever is yelling at her and saying, like, you, you in the blue coat, stop running. And when she realizes that they're talking to her, she stops and it's like, why are you, why should I stop running? And they're like, well, you know, the movements that, like, your behind <laughs> makes when you run is obscene. And she yells at them, well, then stop looking at my ass. Like, I feel like that's something that a lot of, like, American women can definitely relate to. Where it's like, oh, well, your shirt's too lo- low cut. And it's like, well, then don't look at my boobs. Like, I'm sorry. Um, or, like, those jeans are too tight. Well, then don't look at my butt. Like, I don't. It's sort of that thing where it's like, why should I be con- like consistently mindful of what you're seeing when it's my body and I'm comfortable in it? Like, isn't that your responsibility to be responsible for yourself? Like, you know, um, in her case, it was like their hair. Um, I think the explanation given was that the light rays off of hair, like, changes a man and like makes him like want to make love to a woman or something it was something ridiculous and she knew it was ridiculous um and i think it's really similar to where it's like oh well when you wear a skirt like and you go out to a party obviously you're you're asking for trouble it's like no because it's it's just a body like i'm sorry that you can't control yourself and so i think it's something that you can definitely relate to pretty much from any culture. And I think this, this brings up an interesting thing, which this is going to kind of lead to somewhat digression, but I think it's important because of some of the points Kaylee brought out. This is a part of sexism that doesn't get talked about too often, which is when people, um, when, when people look at a woman and go, look at the way she, the when like my, like I have a 12 year old, right? And she, there's a ban at her school on certain kinds of pants because they show too much or whatever. I I mean, it's clearly a ridiculous, right? They're sexualizing pre-sexualized humans. But people, I don't, I I think there's this kind of disconnect between when you say, oh, don't wear those pants, they're too tight. And thinking, well, why do I have to look? Like, why is that her problem that, like, are men animals? Are we ru- Are we ruled? Like, are we really that? It's, it's a dehumanizing thing. I think a lot of mm-hmm. people miss this, is that sexism doesn't just oppress women blatantly. It dehumanizes men. And since we're the ones that can do the most about it, because we can do things like call out people when they're engaging in sexist and misogynistic behavior and we can talk about it because we're the ones doing it right and like this behavior affects us as well like and and think about your son growing up in a world where he's just considered an animal because he can't control himself because a pretty girl walks by that's that's ridiculous like i know many men and i don't know any of them that are compelled to fucking look at a woman just because she's wearing a short skirt you know, and so um, I think that's that's definitely an interesting point, and I think it's a salient one too because that's I when when uh, I think in this country a lot there's a lot of um, there's a lot of thought about 
the burqa and about the way that Muslim women dress and about how that's kind of a form of oppression. And I guess it's oppression if they, it's certainly oppression if they don't want to, but what's oppressive about it is not that they wear it. It's that they have to wear it because men have no responsibility in that culture against the way they act towards women. They have responsibilities. They're just defined by a different social contract than what we might consider. That's, that's fair. And that's the one thing I was going to say. And I think you basically articulated is that I think the biggest problem, like, I think there's one thing that, that you can do with this text. And that's a little bit dangerous in the sense of Marjan and her family were very clearly more Westernized than some of her, their cultural peers. So she has the same kind of notions about some of these things that maybe her peers don't have because they did want a society where modesty has a religious connotation that is spiritual in its execution. And that's the one other problem with, with talking about some of these religious contexts is that when it becomes an oppressive force, that's a problem no matter what religion it is, especially for those of us who prize things like independence, liberty, and democracy. However, there are a number of people who choose to, to abide by that religion's scriptures because they think it actually elevates their existence and is a, is a part of an important religious discourse. So in some ways, it's important to understand that while this text has a lot of different layers of meaning to it and can even stand in some ways as a metaphor for the struggles of iran as it iran excuse me uh as it grows and shifts you know it can't be seen as kind of uh without its own biases right like Mm -hmm. she's an expatriate she lives in paris she left that country because she didn't want to tolerate being there or even struggling against it so in some ways she was a revolutionary only and only until the point where she was more interested in living her life the way she wanted to versus participating in her culture i'm not putting a value judgment on that it's merely a statement of 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 uh fact that that, that's just how she chose to interact through it i mean (laughs) I don't blame her. I'd be in the same situation. I'd be on the first boat out of there. Um, so yeah, I think it's it. And but I mean, I think that's the power of that on the of this story is you know how often and that's how I ran into it. I ran into this in an academic context first, um, and it was used as a text to promote conversation about you know. You know I know Tobiah mentioned this earlier, like Iran is a country that we have a very antagonistic relationship with when reality on the ground is, is that there's a lot more that's in common between the middle class of these two countries than probably not Mm -hmm. outside of some of the specific religious scriptures. But I mean, America already has its own problems chasing its tail on that issue. Like we are so fractured. How can we really honestly look at another country and be like, what's wrong with those guys? Yeah. Um, And that's kind of the point that I was trying to get at is that it's, almost othering in a sense that it's easy to look at this work and go, oh, those wacky Iranians with all of their repression of women, how terrible are they? Right. And it's harder to turn that around on yourself and go, what are my biases? What are the, you know, controls that are built into our society that I'm not necessarily paying attention to? And I think it's important to really meditate on not just the specific forms that the repression that this regime is fostering, not fost- uh that, that it's putting upon its people, not just look at the specific forms, but look at the general types of controls and go, you know, how is this reflected in my life? Right. Well, and the problem with both cultures is zealotry. It's, it's the unquestioning adherence to a system that perpetuates oppression yeah, I, rather than... Uh, you know, you, any any system needs upkeep, and the people are responsible for that upkeep. And I think that's the most interesting thing about this work is that uh, the theocracy that basically took over Iran was started by people that had the best, like the best ideals, right? They had the best motives. They wanted sort of. I mean, well, but they were revolutionaries. They were trying to change their country for what right. they well, thought. She, was she the makes best. the point that there were really two groups of revolutionaries, right. and right. one kind of ate the other, which is not uncommon. And the other thing I think she does a very good job of kind of stating, rather matter of factly, but not really pointing any fingers at. I mean, she states them as fact. Doesn't really spend a lot of time meditating on it on in a I hate the West sort of way. She does a very good job of illustrating that. 
you know, part of the reason this all happened, you know, like the war mm-hmm. with uh, Iraq, for instance, like it wasn't exactly like there was a lack of interference from outside powers. Oh, yeah. She's very clear, like, like her, when she comes back and her father's talking about the eight years that Iran and Iraq are fighting with each other, it's like, well, the Western powers were giving weapons to both sides. This was so devastating because imperialist or you know, former imperialist powers were giving us all guns to shoot each other with, like, you know. And I think that's nice. The other thing that's the other nice thing that humanizes it is that those were just realities on the ground. It, like she makes it clear as far as how she presents things that it wasn't like a lot of people were running around being like, "Oh my God, I hate all Americans." It was just like, "Well, let's be honest; those guys did kind of interfere in our day to day lives. That might be why we have some emotions around those <laughs> folks. <laughs> some, some very deep seated, yeah. difficult emotions. Yeah, I mean, I think this book is an eye opener. I think it does a great job. Uh, of um i think i think she she does a good job of doing what she set out to do which is humanizing the people of iran well which... I, I think that it's a very important work that needs to be widely read oh absolutely and especially I mean... yeah we spend so much time even on this show talking about very escapist very fantastic things yeah you know we talk a lot about superheroes or science fiction or fantasy and there you know there is a power inherent in the comics medium that really doesn't get acknowledged as much as it necessarily should well and this is one of the big reasons i wanted to bring persepolis is because we don't we do talk a lot about uh, escapist works and even when there's slice of life they are, are, there's something escapist about them. Biographical comics, I think, are a sect of, of independent comics that are incredible. And I think it's an incredible way to tell your memoir because I think that, um, as I've tried to articulate this episode, and I don't feel like I've done a good job at it, prose, I think, leaves a lot up to you. Like, you're reading another person's words, but you're, you are, as Brant said, you're kind of filling in the gaps mentally. And with when art is a very I believe that art is a personal thing. I don't I don't really care what kind of art it is. Um the work's not finished until the audience has experienced and, and interpreted it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I think that when you are able to kind of convey what is in your head as an author in in a much less abstract way, because I, I feel that words can be abstract. Sure. I feel that prose lends itself towards abstraction because as has happened to us plenty of times, the way an author uses a word, the way an author uses a phrase can mean a completely different thing to you. Well, this, this is a bit of a digression, but I think that the entire art form of poetry is sort of utilizing the abstraction of, of words and of language and playing with the the sounds and the rhythm and trying to evoke particular emotions through that abstractness. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that cartooning is a lang- it's it's its own language and I think that it gives you I think on the most basic level it gives you something concrete to anchor to. Um, but I also think that it it does this thing. Uh, a few years ago, I gave a presentation to a class I was in about movies and about one of the great things about movies is that they present us with our own shortcomings, but they do it in a way which is detached from us. And so therefore, we're able to kind of look at them and not immediately become defensive about it. We can talk about it and we can analyze it because it's removed from us in some sense. And I think that cartooning has that same kind of effect. You can read it and it's it's non-judgmental and it's not it allows you space between yourself and what you're talking about. And uh because of that, it can make points that are much more sensitive than and they don't seem like propaganda. Um and I mean you see this like even even the great like propaganda films of like of of early of the early Soviet Union, you know, like this, all movies in in the Soviet Union were propaganda, but a well, lot of them are also incredible works of art. Not all of them. 
Well, not all of them, no. But Some uh, of them were subversive. Patina does uh, propaganda. But. Okay, that's fair. That's fair, yes. Mm-hmm. I, okay, all of them were intended to be propaganda. I will... I will uh, there was a master vision provided by the commune. Yeah. Or in master notes. Uh, right? And later there are plenty of, like, uh, Tarkovsky's work is pretty... Uh, fuck him. There <laughs> I just won my pretentious points for the day. That's, uh, that's, that's Kennedy Tarkovsky, right? Yeah, Dexter's totally. Lab? Samurai Jack. Yeah. No, uh... <laughs> I can't, I'm totally spacing on his first name, though. He did Solaris, which is one of my favorite difficult movies to watch. Um, I, mean, I, I am, just for the record, being intentionally obtuse there. No, he totally is. He likes to do it to make me to see if he can make me have an aneurysm. But uh, I think I'm I'm a big fan of this. Like I'm a big fan of Harvey Picar, and I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, I love Persepolis. I love Mouse, even though Mouse kind of I need a week to recover <laughs> after reading it. Um, I, I, I I think it's I think it is the strength of all art that it you know it holds up a mirror. Yeah. Absolutely. And shows you something that you wouldn't necessarily recognize on your own by removing it from you that one little step. Mhm. Well, in this book, I think it was interesting because it was easy to read. It's a very easy format to read, I feel. Um but at the same time, it's difficult to read. I was trying to finish it on, like, my lunch break at work. And I came back after, like, a particular scene. And I was just, like, in a daze for the rest of the day. Like, people would ask me for things. I was just like, what? What? No, I wasn't paying attention to you. Don't you understand that there's all these things going on and they're terrible and they're awful? I don't care that you want chicken strips. Like, it was just, I think. Can I, can I ask you which scene it was? Uh, I can't remember which one. I think it was um, when she was in Europe and she was sick, just like incredibly sick, and she was alone. And it was and just, out on the streets. Yeah, out on the streets. Uh, and it was just sort of like that acceptance of that, and also just like all the things that were going on in her head at the time. Um, it like it just really struck a chord with me because I had had like I've had similar feelings. In much less shitty situations, like, oh, I'm sick and now I have to live back with my parents instead of on my own. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And she's having, like, the same exact thoughts, but she's, like, literally dying out on the streets. And um, I think having having that sort of mirror held up where I don't know if I felt guilty for feeling that because it was, like, like, I've honestly felt that in a very low point in my life. But also seeing somebody else feel that same way and sort of had, like, the same exact thoughts and the same language towards it, um, it just really forces you to self-reflect. Yeah, absolutely. Brent, you were making a face earlier. I want to know the reason for the face. I'm not sure anymore. There's a couple of different things that I that have bounced around in my head that I meant to mention. Um and then I'm just tracking the conversation. Uh, yeah, I think it speaks to the humanizing quality of the of the way that she presents her information, which sometimes is kind of like, you know, sitting in a coffee house with a friend smoking a cigarette being like, and so that was when I was in Europe and wasn't that kind of shitty. Moving on, I became an aerobics instructor later. You know, and it's just kind of like, you're kind of like, what, 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 what? Mm. There's kind of this lightness to it and this depth to it, which I think we've mentioned more than once. She uses vignette. We haven't really mentioned that. No, but, we haven't. But, yeah, but vignette's the primary tool, right? So each of these stories are kind of discreet. She refers to each other's stories. It's not like they are completely blocked off from each other. But I also think that that helps illustrate the biographical nature of it, right? Each vignette is a strong memory or a strong set, set of memories. And so it kind of helps either, you know, these are the snapshots of her existence. Um I hated the way the book ends because it's just like, and it's done. Yeah. And I'm like, where's volume three? Like, I was actually reading on Wikipedia and apparently she wrote more as prose in, I want to say 2009 following the Iranian elections hmm. of that year. Interesting. So, you know, to the extent that she is still an alive person who has experienced that. Yeah, things, absolutely. This story is still ongoing. It's not done. It's just at a stopping point. Well, in her other book, um, her other book like this, Embroideries, is apparently about the, the, the overarching setting is 
her, her grandmother, her mother, and a couple of their siblings, their, her mother's siblings, so her aunts, I guess, uh, sitting around having tea and talking about all these different things, including like sexuality as being a woman in Iran, and but like a lot of other kind of pseudo vignettes. So I have a sneaking suspicion that if folks really liked this, that might be another place to go to get more kind of stories about and also more, maybe not just Marjans about the kind of this this time and some of the folks and what they worry about, you know. And then in a weird way, it is kind of reassuring. Like, wow, there's revolutions and there's wars and there's all these things, but you know, there are still teenage girls worrying about not wanting to go home because it sucks to go home and it's cool to be in Austria. Like, like yeah. in some ways, it's mm-hmm. kind of comforting that the world still moves and that we have those kind of common humanizing experiences, although. Like like we said, it also causes reflection of the things that are different about each of the societies and what the, that means and why. Um, one of the uh, one of the big thoughts that struck me when I finished it was, what happened to her parents? Because you know this ends in 1994 when yeah. she leaves for France, and something that you hear a lot from countries like this is people who are outside of the country being afraid to speak out because they're worried about what's going to happen to their family back home. Right. And, you know, obviously this made a lot of waves and it's not, you know, very rah, rah Iranian government. And so I wonder, you know, she mentions that her grandmother died a couple of years later, but her parents are maybe in their sixties or Mm seventies and could very easily still be alive. And I wonder what's become of them in the intervening time. Sure. Yeah, I, and that might be why Volume Three isn't out yet. <laughs> she might have to be waiting until some things change. That, yeah, that could very well fair. be. To completely derail things, or actually to button hook them all the way back to something, I wanted to. The why isn't I? One of the reasons I had a look on my face. Yes, was because while I find so, what I'm about to say, I have some big caveats attached to because sometimes there's lots of navel gazing conversations in art about art and what art means and is and does. And in particular, especially with something like comics or serialized media or illustrated prose, some of that navel gazing is about, well, what do we call it? Because let's be clear. I mean, the, the, the regular everyday worst use of the word comic tends to evoke superheroes. Although I would say that now 20 years into the image experiment, that word is broken open a lot more than it was 20 or 30 years ago even with the substantial indie independent comics movement that there was cartoons you know i like serialized media as a word just because i think it does manage to kind of cast the web out on all of the different forms and formats they can take you can include newspaper strips the stuff that the indie guys were doing in the 60s 70s 80s indie people not just guys um i like sequential art yeah sequential art is also another one um but I think the reality is is that it's an ex- it's a it's a broad mode of expression, just like film. I mean, Absolutely. television is different than movie, short film different than long film. Like you can do a lot of stuff with lining up frames in a rapid succession and putting sound and light <laughs> together. So, you know, that's the the thing about it is that one of my biggest things about comics, and one of the things that I hope my co- what I say reflects is that. I, don't get me wrong. I love me some superheroes. You only have to listen to other episodes of this show to hear how much I love Kang the Conqueror and yeah. Spider-Man and everything else. But I think comics, sequential art, you know, whatever, can do more, does do more, and people need to appreciate it. So when I talk to folks and they're like, well, I don't read comic books, what they're usually saying is, I don't read superhero Superheroes, books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Persepolis and a few other texts are the one of the first ones that I push over to people. To say, well, maybe this is different than what you're thinking of. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely different than what I was thinking of. Because I've been having people recommend this book to me basically for 10 years. I think it came out between 2000 and 2004. So I, I've had the word Persepolis yelled at me numerous times over the years. And it's something that I've resisted reading just because I'm like... Oh, yeah, it's a biographical comment about this girl who grew up in Iran, and it's going to be serious, and there's going to be emotions, and I want something lighthearted and fun. But when you really get past the surface and 
actually get into it, like there is a a lot of emotional depth there and that, you know, there is something that's really worth reading even if you are somebody who's like, I want a fun experience. Yeah. Uh, something that when I when you were asking or made the comment about when it was published, I looked in my copy because I always like to get that in my mind. So, yeah, original publication was 2000, 2001. What I forgot about until right now but I had been – wanting to talk about a little bit is this was originally published in French because she's in Paris. Yep. I don't even know if she speaks English. She mentions when she gets hired at a cafe that she speaks three European languages. Right. Uh, French, English, and German. Okay. So, and that's right. And she's visited the United States and given talks and stuff. So, yeah, I wondered um, about that too, but I remember, uh, reading a little bit about the, you know, the various steps that this book went through because it was originally released in two volumes. It was originally released in French. It wasn't until... It was originally released in four volumes. Or, yeah, you're right. And then two in in English. In France, it was originally released. Right. But I think it was originally released there and then... Right. It was originally released in French and then it was translated. And I think it's been translated to English twice. I think at least the complete Persepolis is a slight retranslation from the original ones that were published. And I wonder, to a certain extent, just... There are other comics from that time that are autobiographical and deal with non-superhero related material, but European comics, you, the general impression I've always gotten is that Europe is much more uh, accepting of the comics medium as something other than just for children. The, the, well, they have a much longer tradition right. of it. Uh, I mean, even if you just go back to like look at Tintin and how Tintin... And Hergé's work. And right. you should look at Tintin. Asterix. Which you absolutely sure. Asterix. Um, um, I mean, America's history with comics is is on the shorter end, which is probably why it's still such kind of a... Uh, there's a certain kind of... Um, what's the word I want? Uh, stigma? Well, yeah, keep in mind also there was this weird kind of... Because America with its, you know... Uh, we had cultural revolutions, the Comics Code Authority being a perfect example of a cultural revolution that basically kind of cut this medium off at its knees. Yeah, I, mean, I want to. I can't remember the guy's name who led to the Comics Code Authority being a thing. Oh, yeah. But um, the reason why comics are primarily superheroes was because that was the genre that was kind of allowed to survive because it was the Silver Age. Like, it was cartoony and fun and not serious. And there was an entire tradition of romance comics and war comics horror. and horror comics and all of these things that didn't get published in the United States for decades because of the Comics Code Authority. And uh, the that was at the heart of the, of the, the indie innocent. comics movement too. Was a lot of was, was dealing in a lot of those topics. I mean. Right, and part of the reason why European comics and Japanese and generally Asian comics are different from American comics is because they never had that moment where. All of these other genres were kind of just killed off, oh, no, and they absolutely. just had this one thing. Well, yeah, I mean, Wortham and the whole Wortham. That's it. Wortham. Frederick Wortham wrote uh, *Seduction of the Innocent*, and he was a man. He gets villainized a lot when the truth was was that he was kind of thrust into the spotlight by a bunch of very conservative people. He had no, he did not have the expertise to talk about what he was talking about. He did not have the training to make the, the, uh, the claims that he made. And I think he really got swept in and up in it as much as everybody else did. And so that, yeah, that's, that's a pretty yeah, it's dark it point. Like an opinion piece that got taken as, as scientific, uh, <clears throat> for lack of a better word. Well, gospel. yeah, he was like, he was like a, like a, he worked in like a boy's home or something. He was not. It was, it was essentially like an orphanage. Yeah. I mean, he was not a research scientist. He was not somebody that had, uh, and he kind of, I, th- I really honestly think he got swept in and swept up in it as much as everybody else did. But yeah, there were like supermarket protests where, where, uh, housewives would go to the growth, their local market, fill their carts with like meat and, uh, and eggs and milk and then take them to the front of the market and say, if you don't get rid of the comic books, I'm just going to leave this here. And when it's just one, that's one thing. But when it's 20 or 30 and you, you know, we there in the fifties, you didn't have mega markets like you have now. You had little mom and pop places that would, that would represent a significant loss for them. Like, what are you going to do? You know? So comics were relegated to the newsstand 
And uh, that that definitely took a, a place where there was a wealth of things to read and diluted it down to very non-offensive, straightforward superheroes for a very long time. I mean, until remarkably recently, comics were still shipping with the comics code. Well, yeah, but I mean... I mean, as they'd, early as the seventies, that kind of started to mean less and less, despite it having well, that was, being present on the front. Yeah, the the comics code got changed. Like the comics code itself got changed right. numerous times. Well, mm-hmm. as yeah, as time moved on, in the same way that the Hayes Code got was kind of people first. People started ignoring it a little bit, and then people were like, "Oh, okay," with you know, and then the MPAA was was kind of founded, and, and stuff like kind of progressed from there. But one of the biggest things that sort of changed and allowed for more genres within comics too was a shift in the way people viewed influence. Uh, it used to be, and this was specifically when Seduction of the Innocent was written. There was a sort of a magic bullet theory where. Um, Anything that a child watched or read or saw would directly influence the way that they acted. If they saw violence on TV or read it in a comic, they would act out violently. There was no other factor. It was obviously whatever media that they were consuming. And it wasn't until fairly recently that people, and this is still something that people argue about all the time, that it's like, well, no, it's where how they were raised what they're seeing uh who's explaining what they're seeing to them uh what what is their school life like what mental illnesses do they already have do they even have a mental illness or are they just misunderstood you know um so i think that really like understanding communication like that and understanding like how the human mind works really allows for people to kind of delve further into darker topics and explain it and bring it to a light that was not allowed before. Well, and yeah, and being a parent, I understand the drive to like, oh, we've gotten onto a digression real quick, but I just want to say this real quick. No, this being, is fine. Being a parent, I understand the idea that if your child is not behaving, is behaving in a way that you don't understand, the last thing you want to do is go, how am I contributing to this behavior? And the the thing is, is that, I mean, aside from the fact that sometimes kids, you know, when kids are teenagers, especially, they're trying to find their way, they're trying to figure out who they are, and that's going to be a certain amount of pushback. You've seen it like in the 50s, it was comic books. In the 80s, it was metal and D&D. Now, now it's video games. People are always fucking looking for, you know, to give you an example, when the five-year-old burns down the trailer, it's not because his parents left a lighter where he could get it. It's because he was watching Beavis and Butthead, right? Now, Occam's Razor tells us differently. Occam's <laughs> Razor says he fucking was playing with the lighter and he set something on fire, period, right? Like, that's... Whose fault is that? Now, was that a deliberate act? No. People make mistakes. Like It could have been. And it, it very well could have been. You know? It depends. Like, There's people... a lot of different factors. <laughs> and children so get into fucking everything, well, especially and some... when they're three and four. And realistically, some children have behavioral conditions and... where they don't, you know, sociopathy. They don't. That's also true. Some kids are just. I mean, there are All a lot I of know... different ways in which that could. <clears throat> All I know is that when I was five years old, my mom made me an Optimus Prime costume and I grew up to be a robot. That's right. A gay robot. I'm the gay robot, sir. <laughs> All I know is that despite years of training, every time I run around my house with a plastic sword yelling Thundercats ho, no one comes. That's, that's you know, I, despite that's my the saddest thing. Because ever you heard. always do it while I'm in the shower. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm ready. If it, Wouldn't I, that make you come faster? Yeah, exactly. No, you would think it would make him dry off I and mean, get in his Thundermobile and come to me. But no. Thundermobile? Yeah. Yeah. Thunder, Thunder Tank? Th- All the- I Thunder know. Tank. Thunder Tank. Thunder Whatever. Hey. Like, apparently I'm a broken model because my parents bought me Barbies and threw out all my Batman toys and I am still talking about comics. That's so, so sad. That's, it is sad. Um, we we Thanks, encourage Mom and Dad. Now, now that we have fully digressed, yeah. <laughs> is there anything more that we want to say about but, Persepolis? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm coming bringing that whole conversation full circle, there is a much richer tradition of these kinds of, of 
exa- these examples of sequential art. I like to stay away from that because I I believe that uh, while I understand the ye- the need for that kind of thing because there is this stigma attached to the word comics, I'll be goddamned if like if people want to be like, well, I don't read those because they're this. I'm gonna be like, well, you're clearly talking from a very narrow view. Allow me to fucking share some of the shit that's outside of that view with you and expand your fucking horizons well, a little bit. Let's do it. Like, and that's, that's why we and I think that's show. the point of what some folks are trying to do is, is to create a new vocabulary to help that process. Yeah. It's not about it's not about catering to people's being narrow. It's about trying to find a good vocabulary to express the totality of what the medium is capable of. Which is but fair. Like I said, that can get into some 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 weird navel gazing stuff yes. where you end up fighting amongst yourselves and not actually proselytizing the glory of comics which, to oh, other people. Which is why I want to stay the fuck away from it because because really, like at the end of the day, I have little patience for people that would read sequential art but not read comics. Like that's not all I know is that every two to three years, for the last fifteen years, I have seen literally the exact same headline somewhere, which is "Biff, pow, comics aren't just for kids anymore." <laughs> yeah, right. Literally, that exact same headline. Every couple of years, somebody comes up it's with like, it, and you uh, have to go. You have to say to yourself, "You know, I think comics might have an image problem. Yeah. How can we get around that? How can we get people to look at comics seriously and go, oh, well, those are for kids.'" And that's well, that's one of the reasons I fucking show up here every week. And I know that largely we're preaching to the choir, but I guarantee you, I would talk about comics in the same way to even people that didn't. Read would, them. would you just grab it. random people on the street and talk? I to will fucking do it. I have done it. I am you I'm there, man on the corner. <laughs> have you read this comic book? Yes, it's a comic book. Fucking deal with it, okay? And that's the, I, I think that uh, one of the great things we get out of the '80s is this idea that really this medium is limited only by what you decide to do with it, and we are really starting to see the first steps of it moving into other forms where. It really is fucking unlimited. And when you talk about shit like Homestuck and when you talk about like your blog post on like infinite comics and motion comics and how they're doing it wrong and how you could do that right. That's like that shit is right around the corner. And really, that's what I'm excited about is that this this the medium only gets bigger. We only get more people writing. Less people are not writing. More stories are being told in different ways. And while I may not like all of them. The growth of the industry, the growth of the medium is such a good thing because it's just bringing more people in. And that's really the thing is like I get into arguments with Chard all the time about video games and about how he's being unrealistic because he wants everybody to play video games. And then I realize, well, I want fucking everybody to be reading comic books. So does that make me unrealistic or do we both are we both just idealists that kind of like to yell at each other? Yes, that would be the case. I don't want literally everybody to be reading comic books because then I wouldn't get to be part of the cool kids club that reads comic books well, like we all were, of you are in. Because, but then we'd just be able to say we were reading them first. No, because then <laughs> we become weird hipster douchebags and I'm not down for that. Uh, some of us are already weird hipster douchebags in some way. I don't say it anymore, but I definitely think it. I'm not a douchebag. No, you're I won't talk to those face. other things. <laughs> you're a smarmy beard face. But... I was, he was we, into beards before beards were cool. <laughs> oh, I've always been into beards. Yeah, two years, two years old, running around, little good, <laughs> little goatee, wispy thing. Uh, are we, are we good on Persepolis? Have we said everything that needs to be said? I have something to say. Okay. Yeah. Why are you always trying to rush us? I'm, <sighs> I'm just checking. Attention, listeners. Learn something about Iran. Learn something about other cultures. Go read this book. Yeah. It may not, even if everything we've just said makes it sound not that interesting, give it a shot. It's worth it. Yeah, fight against your Xeno. Like I, there's a trend in movies these days to like present foreign lands as like you're gonna get some weird parasite, or you're gonna get kidnapped and sold into white slavery, or you're gonna get killed, or blah blah blah. It's largely bullshit. Learn about other cultures because it's a fucking rich. There's a, a whole goddamn world out there that is not you, and. They have incredible traditions and they have incredible food. Like, get involved just for the food because it's like, (laughs) 
Amazing thing, and, right? If you need a reason, seriously, you can learn a lot about a culture through the food that it eats. And I'm only about 50% joking here. If you go abroad, bring your Superman shirt because everybody knows Superman. That's true. That's true. Yep. So, yeah. Having been abroad with a Superman shirt, I can confirm. Having only ever been male, I can't confirm. I've never been female and I've never had a Superman. Uh, uh, oh, you're just every week. You're giving me a shitty joke to go <laughs> to yeah. you love it. No. Anyways, that was hilarious. I laughed. I don't care if anybody else did. I didn't. I found it offensive. Ooh. As a broad with a Superman shirt. That's just encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, that gets a point. Uh, but yeah, read read Persepolis, learn about other cultures. I think that's cool. Read comic books. Tell your friends to stop being pretentious and read comic books. But read comic books before you tell them to read comic books so you can be part of the cool kids. Well, part. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that you can be pretentious that you read comics before yeah. they did. So you can that's be right. the most pretentious. And just, just remember that, important. yeah. Absolutely. And remember one day you'll be pretentious enough. To have a podcast. <laughs> or pretentious enough to have been a long-standing comic book writer who then talks crap about other comic books, like Alan Moore. That's true. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely true. Well, when doesn't Alan Moore talk crap about anything? That's, well, top ten. Well, sure, he doesn't talk crap about his own stuff. Yeah. Well, no, but top ten is actually oddly hopeful and fun. And oh, sure. not full of, like, dark and death and, like, superheroes suck. That's my... What's that? The GIF that Kaylee Kaylee posted oh, a GIF up to her, <laughs> up to her. It's and it's a famous one too because it's Alan Moore and he's like turning off the light and he's like, "Good night, boys and girls," and it's because he's a fucking he's he's, he's a, a necromancer. Level necromancer. I yeah. think that made him like my favorite person because he just he's like has a little cord for the light and is like, "Good night, children," and then turns it off and it's just like. Is the best thing. I laughed for like 20 minutes. Well, there's something inherently creepy about the bare light bulb with the hanging cord. Mm-hmm. It's never a good thing. Like, that's never in a happy room. Nope. Um, it's not. And I, but I, I picture him saying it, at, but it's Warren Ellis doing his voice. He's like, good night, boys and girls. <laughs> that was a wonderful impression of Warren Ellis doing an impression of Alan Moore. Alan Moore, thank you. Thank Can we move snake, on to recommendations? The snake is eating its tail. Can that be a thing that happens now? It is a thing that happens now. Okay. Brant, what would you like to recommend? I love few authors in this world as much as I love Greg Rucka. Uh. I think we should read international spy novel spy novel spy <laughs> spy graphic novel queen and country operation broken ground which is volume one of his award-winning series about british operatives doing british spy type things uh the reason that i'm particularly fond of this series is i actually came across greg rucka as a novelist before i ever got into his comics um and given my personal and family background international espionage has always been something that i've been quite fond of and interested in reading about and rucka's work and Queen and Country is interesting for a couple of reasons outside of it's about British spies doing British spy things is that it's very realistic. So it's kind of like what if James Bond style stuff was actually realistically happening in the world. It's very well informed. Rucka does his research and knows a lot about the geopolitical things that he's talking about. And the kind of interesting thing about how he creates Queen and Country is that each each trade, basically, it's between four and eight issues, depending on the story, I believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he has a different artist. So Queen and Country is always written by Rucka, but it's drawn by different artists for different arcs. And then what makes Queen and Country even kind of crazier is that because he's a novel writer, it actually has three novels interspersed within its arc of total publishing. And I think I've only read two of those novels, yeah. so I have some work to do. And then, of course, he said that he's actually going to start what would equate to volume two sometime in the near future. But for now it stands at eight, eight trades, three novels. I thought there were seven trades. I believe eight is operation red Panda. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong and I missed one and I have even more work to do than I said. It's an excellent series. And in fact, I pitched it once months ago in your absence. And I specifically called out that I'm sorry that I had to do it because you weren't here, but uh, this is an excellent Excellent series, and 
there have been kind of omnipresent rumors that this would be adapted to a movie for years and years now. Actually, Greg has multiple multiple times confirmed that it is actually in production, and Ellen Page has been tapped to play Tara Chase. I think I did hear that now. Yeah, that which I don't know how I feel about, about that. Yeah, but. it's interesting because the way that she's presented on the page, I've always pictured her as a relatively tall woman, mm-hmm. and Ellen Page is like pocket sized. Yeah, but movie magic on that one. They make Tom Cruise seem humongous and he's only like 5'4". Fair enough. So. So yeah, that's a excellent excellent series. Love it, love it. Joe, what how did you, you bring this week? How do you feel about it? Well, um I brought The Tick by <laughs> Bed at Ben Edland. Uh and it's the original 12 issues. And uh, the thing I love most about the tech is it's uh, ostensibly a deconstruction of superheroes, but it's mostly about this guy. I that... would say that it's more a satire of oh, superheroes. Okay, yeah. satire. Uh, satire is much better, yes. Uh, even though I didn't fucking ask you. <laughs> <laughs> And you Joe, I, I feel, right I feel like our, our friendship has passed the point where you need to ask me to interrupt you and correct you. That's fair. You're walking home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it is, I think satire is, is, it is a much better description. Uh, it's basically about this guy that dresses in this blue suit as the superhero of the tick. And uh, he may not be all there. So maybe a little crazy. Uh, he, he comes may not into the, be half there, even. He may not even be half there. Yeah. Um, the one thing he knows for certain is that he is a superhero, and that he must destroy evil. And he stands for justice and truth and all that is good. And uh, he ends up fighting a bunch of ninjas with uh, his sidekick Arthur, uh, who is a Mothman. And uh, his superhero name is Arthur. And his superhero name is Arthur. And it's it's great. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's an older hugely thing. influential. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and spawned not only a cartoon but a live action show, which I don't think was as good as the cartoon. But that's just me. That that is a point of some debate. Uh, I love Patrick Warburton. It was more the whole like uh, I never understood why. Well, I do. Anyways, uh, it's. It's just a lot of fun. Uh, and it's, it, I think, unlike a lot of satires, which I think are being done to kind of take the piss out of something, this one honestly feels like it was done out of love. Like, there's a lot of Absolutely. love in this book, and it's a lot of fun, and it's honest. You know, it's like, Bed Endland is really good at kind of tapping into uh, these really interesting things about what makes a, a hero heroic. And even if you're not familiar with the tick itself, Ben Edlund personally oh, outside been... of the tick has had his fingers in a lot of pies oh, yeah. over the years. Yeah. He was instrumental in Firefly. Uh, he heavily influenced Venture Brothers, including writing at least one episode. Yeah. Uh, he was involved in Super... Dr. Horrible. Supernatural. If I recall Supernatural. Correctly. He, he gets around season. a lot. <laughs> oh, Ben. Yeah. He's been, he's been around and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. The Tick. Awesome. Chum. Kaylee? Uh, I am going to recommend a book. It's been generating like a lot of buzz, so maybe it's not a huge surprise, but I do really love it. It's uh, Kelly Sue DeConnick's Captain Marvel, uh, specifically the first trade in Pursuit of Flight. Um, and I could go into like all the reasons why, like as a feminist, this book is amazing. But honestly, it's just a really awesome superhero, like kicking a ton of ass. And just being awesome. Um, and it's, to me, it's a very classic sort of superhero story. But told as, like, there's like a twist because she's a woman. But she doesn't act like how a lot of people try to write women, which is like, oh, well, I'm in love with this guy or anything like that. Like, she's a, she's a heavy hitter. 
they write her as a three-dimensional human being with her own I motivations know. and goals. It's right? so weird. I want my Cara Danvers, Danvers back to how she was in the 80s. Amnesiac and being raped by future people. Yeah. That she birthed herself or whatever the damn story <laughs> yeah, is. Her own future son. Future From another son. dimension. That's right. God. <laughs> was that the 80s or the 70s? Uh, well, I mean, it, I think Chris Claremont did his kind of attempt to fix it all in Avengers Annual. I think it's number three. So I, I don't know the exact publication date, but I'm pretty sure of the comic rate. I thought by the 80s she had turned into binary and had been exiled to outer space. Yeah, you know. Like like happens. No. To you sometimes. The only small niggling problem I have with Captain Marvel is that I love Gina Svell, which I didn't get to talk about enough during our Avengers event uh, forever. Uh, well, maybe uh, you should pitch the other Captain Marvel series <laughs> that stars Gina Svell sometime, and we can talk about that. And we no. can do a backup episode, too. You know... Like we can, we can always do a uh, sixty-nine point now. <sighs> Tempting. Sixty-nine <laughs> is in the past, Joe. This is episode seventy. Get yeah. with the get with the day. We are the showrunners, and we are the dreamers of the dreams. Okay, so Tobiah, what have yeah. you got to recommend? <laughs> uh, so I'm bringing back a book that I pitched a couple of months ago, and then at the time I said I was going to bring back sooner rather than later. So I have brought Rat Queens Volume One. Sass and Sorcery. Uh, this is a book by Image. It's uh, collecting the first five issues, and it's a group of four female adventurers in the classic Dungeons and Dragons sense. You've got the Elven Mage, the Joe dropping his phone. <laughs> it was a spell. Uh, you've got the Elven Mage, the Human Cleric, the Smidgen Rogue, and the Dwarf Fighter. Uh, but they're all women and they're in this town that really doesn't much care for them because they're constantly causing shit and getting into drunken brawls and just having a good old time. And it's just kind of a fun, funny, crazy Dungeons and Dragons-esque fantasy story where they're running around fighting monsters and getting into trouble and tripping on mushrooms and it's it's really well written the art is amazing it's just a really great really fun series from image now one of many that they're doing but honestly it's probably the comic that i'm looking forward to the most each month right now image right now is like the yankees in the 20s man they are just destroying it like I, I is playing at their level at this point i'm honestly willing to call it a renaissance yeah, I, I mean, the only reason I don't necessarily buy that particular line of logic is that how much can, I mean, it, it's like saying image is really good at having all these people come to them and say, we would like to sell something that is really good with you. Like image isn't doing it per se. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe they have a very sophisticated uh, process of going out and finding writers but i mean a lot of the people who are doing great work through image already have careers and are surely using images model to kind of self-publish in a certain in, in kind of a more structured well, way versus image having a, a cabal of editors who are going out and like creating an environment for good story making let, let me put it this way intention aside image is putting out dozens of incredibly good books I mean, yes right and now. i'm not trying to say when that, yeah, that's not true I just, five Six years ago, that wasn't necessarily the I case. I mean, Image is allowing a place for people to come. They're telling a, di they're allowing people that want to tell a right. diverse range of stories. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like clearly, these are people that are going to Image and going, "Hey, we want, we have this idea, we want to do it." But I feel like there was a time when Image was like most comics publishers, very much like this is the kind of story we tell. And now they're much more. I mean, just the width and breadth of comics available through image as a publisher right now is kind of astounding to me because yeah. like literally fantasy comics, sci-fi comics, slice of life, superhero. Uh, on some level, there must be some kind of editorial discretion that goes into what are we and are we not publishing? Sure. I guess to a certain extent, my skepticism is maybe that I think there's a big boom in creators wanting to own their work. I think Absolutely. for a really long time, there was a big push by writers and artists to try to get themselves hooked to the big two to because they wanted to be able to play in the big sandbox and now there's a great i think there's we're now shifting to the 
both because of this it rewards writers and artists more by them owning their own intellectual property, but because of folks like Robert Kirkman and some others who've managed to, you know, kind of test the waters, a lot more of these artists are, are putting in it themselves into a position to succeed by saying, I'm going to take the chance to publish under this model. So I guess that's why sometimes when I read things that are like, oh my God, Image is hitting it out of the park. It's like, or they got a whole bunch of artists come to them and say, we want to do profit sharing on something that we're pretty sure is going to do okay. And Image was smart enough to say, we like money. But we've seen the case where publishers have not been that smart. Well, yeah, absolutely. And publishers I mean, have been shady and underhanded. Oh, in sure. Dealings. And the fact that Image is willing to be like, hey, you have a good idea. If you think it'll sell, let's do it. Right. And they're the no, third no. biggest publisher right now. No, and I'm not, I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to diminish that. I mean, Image has infrastructure. Image has Why do you want to tear them down? <laughs> Because I want Oni Press to succeed more. <laughs> I no, I mean I, well, I do like Oni Press. Hey, Queen and Country, but uh, fuck Image up with Dark Horse. Uh, Word. Poor. Well, actually, not poor Dark Horse. You know, I, I would be more worried about them. We're at four or five years ago, but luckily they're losing Star Wars. But they've got some kick-ass stuff coming out. Hey, yeah. don't discount IDW. They just wrapped no. up Lock and Key, which was awesome. Uh, and Walt Simonson just announced Ragnarok, <laughs> the his new series from IDW that's going to be coming out later this year. Comic book pitch I have heard in years. I thought I Hashtag could not get any Thor not Thor. Thor not Thor. I thought that when Mike Allred, when I found out that Mike Allred was going to be penciling Silver Surfer, I didn't think that anything could happen in comics that would make me more happy. And then Walt Simonson was like, yeah, I'm going to tell a story about Thor that's not Thor, and it's going to be awesome. We're, we'll put the pitch up on the website. Or yeah, well, the, Facebook page. The, you can you can Google it yourself. Yeah, Walt Simonson, Ragnarok, so 2014. Have to link to something. Yeah, it's, I uh, will put it up on the Facebook. He is he is doing his own story about Thor in a post Ragnarok period that is not the Marvel Thor. It's his own creative own work based Creator on the original Thor. Yeah. Based on the original Norse myths, published by IDW, it sounds incredible. It does. So, Brent, what are you voting for? <laughs> Can you not? <laughs> like, I totally forgot what the books were. No, I'm just trying to... I'm going to go with Captain Marvel. All right. Joseph? Uh, this... Uh, I'm going to go with Red Queens. I wanted you to wait until there was more, because I think the first trade leaves it kind of... I think that story is still being developed. It It is, but I don't think that, that it's ever necessarily going to reach a point where it's like, okay, this is all done, until it's all done. And I think I'd rather talk about it now, assuming Kaylee votes for it, uh, <laughs> so that people can get up to speed and catch up with it when there's only been, I think one issue since this trade that's fair but it's really up to her to vote for what she wants to read uh i am going to have to go with rat queens because i think other than captain marvel that's been like my most favorite mostest favoritest thing uh that has come out in a very long while so awesome uh for the record i'm gonna vote for queen and country because mm. i think that book rocks i realized that i didn't even make this comment that We've already voted, so I, this is mostly for listeners as far as um, if you want. Greg Rucka has a reputation for writing, I think, relatively strong female characters. He does have a tendency to make them the new versions of a lot of male characters. However, because Queen and Country is his own property, that doesn't happen. But the main character is a woman, and so she's one of the first women in no, British. We, we mentioned so, Tara Chase. Yeah, I said it, but I don't okay. think I explicitly mentioned that one of the reasons that I find this text so impressive is that I think he does a very good job about addressing the, the the both Tara as a human being, and then also kind of making some comments about her, her what role her femininity and her being a female play, and both how she's perceived and how she accomplishes her goals, and what that means and why. Like I think he doesn't shy away from addressing that. Like people don't treat her as an equal, even though she's clearly better than almost all of them. You know things like that. So. That, no, that's Hooray fair. for strong female uh, protagonists, I guess is what I'm trying to say. SFP? Indeed. I love so, how when Greg Rucka, real quick before we No, end, go ahead. Uh, whenever 
there is an interview with Greg Rucka. One of the first questions is, how do you write such strong female characters? And his answer is invariably, I don't write strong female characters. I write strong. Like, I think about what a character's motivation is. I think about who they are right. and what their goals are and what they want to do. And then I write them like that. And I'm like, that's it, right? Like, if you're doing that, then you're probably going to have a recognizable character on the other end of, of whatever you're writing. That's just called good writing. Totes. Totes for real. All right. So next week, Rat Join Queens. Us next week for Rat Queens. And, and if you haven't yet, face. go do one of the many things that you can do to enter our contest and maybe win a free bat book. I'm going to go enter right now. You're ineligible. God, because Damn it. fuck you, Joe. Am I ineligible? Yeah, you yeah, are on the podcast. Yeah, so. you are. If you've been on the podcast, you are not eligible. I'm sorry. Me, 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 me. Following on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, now you shouldn't do it. Twitter now that you've account. been on the show, don't don't I, follow. Don't no, like. Nope. Be an island unto yourself. Lost forever. That's right. All right. Bye, everybody. Love you. Ta ta. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Me From The Gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.